Roman Jacko. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're organizing this event from the unceded lands of the Kulin and nearby nations. Our speaker, Bryce and Peter, are on Boon land, Chris on Wurundjeri land, and I'm on Wadawurrung country. Our computer expert, Alex, is far away in, and on Jagger and Turnbull lands. They've all cared for and managed these lands in a sustainable and responsible manner for many tens of thousands of years. When the initial settlers arrived, the common statement was the land was like a gentleman's park and the soil is so friable with good grasses and bulbs. We need to respond to their welcome to country by also truly caring for this country. We have much to learn from them, not only on their land, farming and fire practices, but also their governance procedures, which led to no major wars across this continent for tens of thousands of years. I offer my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to all of their mobs and to people from other mobs attending today, and to all of you who have logged in from near and also from far away. Hi, I'm Rob Gardner, and I help support these meetings with Chris, Rick, and Peter. And today, my particular thanks to Alex, who's managing all these activities in the background. Firstly, some housekeeping. Tonight's presentation and Q&A will be recorded and available to download in a few days' time from the Renew website. If you have any technical problems or general comments, please use the chat button on the bottom left of computers. If you have any questions, enter them at any time using the Q&A button in the center bottom. Keep the questions fairly short if possible. We usually have lots of questions, so we'll probably combine some similar ones and cover as many as possible in the time available. Some of you are new to a Renew webinar. Briefly, a Renew was formed in 1980 to, to promote sustainability in all its forms. It's best known for its two magazines, Renew and Sanctuary, but also events such as uh, Sustainable House Day in October with various associated information sessions and Speed Date and Expert, sometimes virtual. Also EV fairs and attending other, many other fairs and events. However, it also has a significant research section and a lobbying group. Free modeling packages, the Sunolator and Tankulator, and also an advisory service aimed not only for households, but is offered to businesses and governments. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Bryce Gaden making a presentation before an extensive Q&A session, and then followed by a meet the committee and discuss future events and assistance required. Most Renew members will know Bryce as he's given us several presentations on EVs previously, and has been involved in electric vehicles for many years and is extremely knowledgeable. He writes for Driven and Renew, he was the founder of EV Choice, an electrician and trainer at Melbourne Uni, amongst many other items. So Bryce, I'd like to hand over to you and thank you. Oh, thank you, Rob, and, and welcome to all the uh, members of Renews attending tonight. And, and hopefully I'll be able to answer a few more of your EV questions. Okay, I'll quickly share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, just trying to get my... There we go, I'll just shift that over there and shrink that up for myself. The good, that's much better. Okay, I'm going to do today the latest version of my what, why, when guide and add a few more details in as I go. I'm planning a talk for about 45 minutes unless someone chooses to, to shorten my time um, and allow at least 15 or more minutes, I'm guessing for a Q and A at the end. Uh, so jot down your questions in the, the, Q, the question session a section and they'll be answered at the end it's a little bit easy normally i would be able to talk if it was in live and answer the questions 
as we went, but it's a little hard in the webinar format. So today I'm going to cover a few things, uh, basically what's different about EVs compared to ICE or internal combustion engine and cover the terminology and technology, which some of you will be getting to know that's a couple of slides that I do there. Hopefully I'll have a few new details and um, because I often use lots of terminology in EVs like a lot of people in EV territory, um, at least I can uh, hopefully inform you and give you a good exam at the end and make sure you know it all well. Uh, then I'll go through what's available in Australia and elsewhere and why it benefits you and the environment and when to consider making the move. And I'll throw a few other details about my experiences with EVs along the way. Okay, first up, uh, EV transition, I have to remind everybody is always coming, always coming in all forms. It's not just the electric cars, which I'll be talking about tonight. We have trucks. Um, all of these things I'm putting up by the way are actually made and on the roads or in the air, on the water. Um, only two of them aren't actually on uh, or available for sale yet. So two of these pictures will be uh, available or not available yet to buy. Everything else is already available. So I'll uh, maybe I'll leave that to the end of the presentation and people can work out which two of them they were. Uh, okay, you can get bicycles, lots of electric bicycles running around now. If you go around town and all the Deliveroo type meal delivery uh, people, pretty much electric everything, electric scooters, electric bikes, electric sort of mini motorbikes, some of which are legal and, and some of which may not be, but we won't go there tonight. Uh, motorbikes, yes, you can buy electric motorbikes now. They're still quite expensive, but they're getting to be very good. Uh, there are actually electric aeroplanes around. That's an electric trainer whose name has just escaped me as I momentarily, as I've come to it, um, but that's available for purchase here in Australia, both South Australia and West Australia, and they use as a fleet of uh, flight trainers as well. In fact, Norway is proposing that all short haul flights by 2040 must be electric. Uh, you can buy flying cars, that's called the Black Fly and is registered for sale as a one seater aircraft in America. Uh, and they're hoping ultimately will become one of these autonomous drones that simply drops down in front of you, you hop in, it'll take you to where you're going. Autonomous forms, that thing was actually built here in Australia, in fact, in Melbourne. Um, it's built by AEV, that's a prototype. Oops, I gave away one of the two that you can't buy yet. Uh, but that one has actually been uh, filmed around driving around Melbourne Uni for a promotional video. Buses, there's lots of electric buses around. One of the, uh, what do you call it, provinces in China has just changed its fleet of 10,000 buses for all electric. So yes, overseas, there's an enormous amount of activity in buses. Here in Australia, much less so, although some of the big companies are now starting to build electric buses. So after a few fits and starts uh, over the past, I was following a few companies that were building buses here and all of them either detoured into something else that was easier or went broke. So now that the bigger companies are getting in, it's looking far more promising. Uh, and electric ferries. I was quite amused last week when the New South Wales minister uh, was saying, oh, we're now going to have a uh, offsets for all our electric trains by 2024. Um, and we'll even start converting some of, our, some of our smaller ferries. But oh, no, the bigger ferries will sink with the weight of batteries. Uh, that one there, the Ampera, I think that one's 32 cars and something like 300 passengers. And there's a number of others around of similar and bigger ones that are going on the, the drawing board now. So they have something like a four megawatt hour battery. So uh, they suck a fair bit of juice when they pull into the port and unload. But because they unload cars and spend a bit of time loading and unloading, there's plenty of time with a big enough charger to recharge the things and off they go. Something like 80, 90% reduction in fuel costs and running costs, let alone the noise and the pollution that you no longer have with those. Anyway, I'm going to come back to cars and say transitions do happen faster and quite often, in fact, usually happen a lot faster than people think. Those two photos are of New York's Fifth Avenue in 1900 and 1913. In 1900, there was one vehicle and the rest was all horse and carts. 13 years later, if you looked really carefully into that picture, there's the butt end of a horse and a small carriage and everything else is electric. And that's how fast it happens. It's basically a, an uptake. Starts off slowly, then you get a, if like people can see me, it sort of starts off slowly and it goes zoom up and then tapers off at the end. And a number of countries, the zoom up's already happened. It's around seven to 10% sales, but you start getting that almost exponential style of growth. So that's what can happen. And I'm saying it will happen fairly quickly. Um, okay, terminology wise, we can have um, a number of terms that you've been banded, batted around over the years. Uh, you've all heard of the hybrid electric vehicle, which is the third one along on your right. 
And that's the old Toyota Priuses and those types of things. They run on petrol and use the electric motor and battery as an energy saving device whilst braking. So they're not truly an electric vehicle. And some of the bands that I'll talk about on the sale of ICE or internal combustion engine vehicles coming along in the next few years, they are included in the ban because they're not considered to be true electric vehicles. The electric vehicles are considered as the plug-in electric ones, which is the two on the left. There's the full battery electric vehicle, um, which have been and are still relatively expensive compared to an ordinary car. But the plug-in hybrid has been sort of the intermediary with the smaller battery. So the expensive part is smaller and they keep the petrol motor. And they have a good use case. Unfortunately, with the fuel emission standards, putting in something with a tiny battery actually gave them lots of credit for um, uh, for giving low emission vehicles when they weren't really, if you had a 10 or 12 kilometer range on battery only, they really weren't electric cars. But anyway, they, they got themselves the credits. The new um, European laws actually now basically require cars to or plug in hybrids to have bigger batteries, which is why some of the ones coming in now are getting back to the longer ranges that things like the Holden Volt and things like that had the 60, 70, 80 kilometers. They were down to you know, 12, 15 at one stage. And the one on the far right is the hydrogen car. I'll speak more about that later, or the fuel cell EV. They're still an EV. They still run an electric motor, but they use hydrogen in a chemical reaction to basically create electricity. So the hydrogen tank, you fill it up, and in a fuel cell, it converts or creates electricity, and waste is water and uh, basically just water vapor, hot water, effectively. And they also need a battery because hydrogen fuels hydrogen fuel cells are very much like diesel engines. They don't like acceleration and deceleration very, they like to run at a constant speed. So the electric motor and battery work very well to take the ignitions and accelerations and soak up the braking as the regenerative energy. Anyway, I'll talk more about them a little bit later. Um, EVSE, uh, electric vehicle supply equipment, um, commonly called a car charger, erroneously called in the case of an AC one, which is the three on your left, a car charger, because the AC to DC conversion, because the batteries in them are DC, happens inside the car. So they just simply supply power. So the AC types are really just an automatic power point where they turn on and off at the command of the car. And when the car says it doesn't really need to be charged or isn't ready to be charged because it's on a set on a timer, the lead running to the car is dead, there's no electricity in it. So they're just a safety issue. So they're just an automatic PowerPoint, but colloquially called charges. So I'll, I'll give up on trying my best to stop them being called that. The two on the right are real charges. They're their D phase fast charge. They actually do the AC to DC conversion in that box, which is why they're so much bigger. And then they feed DC directly to the car and the battery management system is the one that controls the charging process from then on. And they will give you really fast charging rates as I'll mention in a little while. Okay, a number of people will keep asking me about what's vehicle to grid or vehicle to home. Um, the generic term for that is V2X. Um, V2H, which a lot of people talk about, is a vehicle to the home. So it basically feeds power in behind the meter and powers your house, but doesn't provide power to the grid. Vehicle to grid, V2G, which is the one a lot of people get quite excited about, um, will also feed not only the house, but to the grid as well. And that V2X is therefore the general term for them both. There's another one that's bizarre to be batted around is um, V2D, which is vehicle to device, which is effectively a power point in your car and you can run power, power your um, power tools or whatever from your car. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one later. Anyway, it's done via your DC connector in the car. Currently, that is only Chadamo, which is also only in Nissan left. So the Nissans and the IME, or the Mitsubishis had Chatamo ports and a separate AC charging port, which is the one on the right there. Um, and they were big chunky ports with big chunky requirements for the uh, charging area. And whilst an interesting system and, and worked very well with the early EVs, big, they have basically been overtaken by what's called the Chatamo system and it's basically uses a CCS or combined charging system and that has become the de facto standard around the world now. So CCS is one nice plug and it allows big people to have a much smaller port on the car so the manufacturers quite like those and that has pretty much been settled standard now for a year or two even Tesla has adopted it in the Model 3 and its coming models will be CCS. So that one's not yet developed for vehicle to grid or V2X stuff, but it is being done so, and it'll be about, I think, 2025 uh, before the systems and hardware approved for CCS. 
uh, vehicle to the grid. So it's looking like something around 2025 before you'll be able to buy systems easily for it at the moment. It's about $15,000 or more to convert your house and do a Chatamo system. And none of them are actually approved for use here in Australia. They're still being trialed. There's, nobody's been rushing because there's so few cars that use it. Okay, another point is I get the question a lot of how do I charge? And the key point with the electric vehicles is not to do with petrol stations anymore. It is a totally different paradigm. You don't, um, well, more to the point, you think plug and ignore. You come home, you plug in, and then you unplug in the morning. So I always say my charging takes me 20 seconds because I will come home, plug in, takes me 10 seconds. Next morning, I wander out, unplug it, another 10 seconds, and off I go. It's just like your mobile phone. And for day-to-day -day stuff around town, the DC chargers are just for the people who forget to charge their car at home when, when that happens. So they've got a bit of a top up as well as for the longer range stuff. Uh, and you're definitely not anymore finding stopping and acting as a fuel pump attendant for your, your car in wet weather, dry weather, hot weather, cold weather, um, like we've been having lately here in Melbourne. And uh, you don't have to sort of be victim to the petrol price cycle. You can choose your price cycle depending on when you want to charge and your off-peak rates of electricity overnight. So an addendum, to, oops, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, how fast can I charge? This is pretty much the sort of the mental table that I have in my head whenever I'm with my electric car. You'll probably end up with a similar sort of thing either in your head or you can put a little table like this in your glove box. If you're trying to charge via a PowerPoint, you'll get uh, 15 kilometers charged per hour take a while to charge my car in 28 hours. It's not your preferred method, but it's a bit like having a jerry can in the boot, but a lot less messy. So you just plug into the nearest power point and that will get you in an hour, 15 kilometers, and it should get you to something faster to charge with, you know, something like the, the, net, the bottom AC one, which will give you 45 kilometers charged an hour. And that's what I use here at home. And that'll be, that will fully charge my Kona in nine hours. So easily overnight, or if I'm stopped in a caravan park and I use a 15 app outlet, 18 hours, so if I drive in at 5 p.m. of an evening at Caravan Park, plug into the 15 amp outlet by eight the next morning, even if I was completely empty, I'm ready all right, probably nine. If I was about 10% left, I would be ready to go with a full charge again. Your DC charger with the ones you use on the road, my Kona's almost old technology now, it has a maximum of 70 kilowatts charging. Those big chargers now will do up to 350 kilowatts. And the next crop of EVs coming out, um, I was just reading about some of the big utes and things coming out and Porsche Taycan and like will do that sort of charging rate, which means you'll get a several hundred kilometers within five or 10 minutes. So, and a full charge in five to in 10 to 15 minutes. And you're only using those on the highway anyway. So barely get time to shoot into the toilet and have a cup of coffee. Okay, how fast do I need to charge is the key question, because do you need that 10 minute full charge all the time like a petrol station? Well, no. If you do less than 200 kilometers a day, a power point will do the job. Uh, an overnight charge would pretty much, for 200 kilometers, you'd be easily charged in less than eight hours, back back up to so 100 k's or 50 k's. The average commute in Melbourne is only 30 k's, so you'd be at 15 kilometers, two hours overnight would keep you topped up. Uh, about five hundred dollars to put in a proper fifteen amp or ten amp outlet dedicated to car charging. Uh, the standards now require it to be a separate circuit taken straight back to the switchboard, not detouring anywhere else. Um, I always, however, recommend this is not the preferred method to always charge a car, and this is why. Plugs, three-pin plugs, are not meant for a continuous long-term load, and they don't like it. And ultimately, the socket loosens or the pin loosens or a something starts getting a little bit loose and it overheats like those pictures there. When that starts to happen, by the way, it then deteriorates very fast. Um, if you're doing your full range each day, 400 Ks, as I said, I can recharge my car in nine hours overnight. So for most stuff, in fact, virtually all stuff, and the statistics are 90% or over of electric car charging is done at home if you have that access or at work if you only have access there. Um, yeah, I think I did that bit. And they cost $1,500 up, including the EVC, depending on uh, what sort of one. If a nice, simple, dumb one, about $800 for the basic one and 700 ish to install. Sometimes they can cost up two, two and a half for really whiz bang smart ones that you can program and read on an app. Um, so you're looking at 700 up to install them, depending on how easy it is. If it's next to the socket, circuit board, 700 is probably almost generous. Uh, but if it's a long way away, under driveways and things, well, like any sort of electrical job, it takes time. 
Okay, this one's a tricky one for people to understand. In some ways, our Australian standard for quoting the range on the Green Vehicle Guide gives particularly ridiculous numbers. And the Green Vehicle Guide basically uses NEDC. It's actually, uh, I'm trying to remember the um, ADR 8102, which is effectively NEDC, the one on the left there. And for the 40 kilometer, kilowatt hour leaf, it says 315 Ks. Nobody will get that. Uh, 285 is closer if you're driving around town and the US EPA, as I'll explain in a minute, is about 240. And if you're doing longer outer suburban country runs, that's probably closer to what you'll get. So NEDC is the old European standard and still in use here and generally 30% or more too high. It, it is just comes out with ridiculous numbers. WLTP, Worldwide Light Vehicle, no, I give up, uh, WLTP will do. I always forget what the acronym stands for. Uh, is the new European standard and comes close if you're driving mainly city, middle to outer suburban use. So in my Kona, which uh, says there 550, sorry, 484, I will comfortably get that around town. In fact, my, my um, range gauge will often go over 500 if I'm just beetling around town. Uh, whereas 413 for the US EPA, that's pretty much what I'll get if I'm driving Melbourne to Brisbane. And as I said, the US EPA is definitely sort of middle outer suburban and regional driving. So I always recommend if you're buying it for general commuting and the odd trip out of town, use the WLTP. Australia will eventually change to that. So all my data sheets and things that I make available use are switching over to WLTP and I just give up on quoting the old NEDC figures as per the Green Vehicle Guide. If you're looking up the Green Vehicle Guide, they're good for comparison of ranges, but you will never achieve them. Uh, again, if you've got any questions, I've got some articles that I'll refer to later, you can look them up. Uh, yes, I actually put it in there for you. Uh, the last edition, I put in an article on just that particular and explain a lot more detail about it. Uh, does an EV go to distance? Yes, our friend, uh, oh, Start off early petrol, early days, petrol pumps were only introduced after World War One, which is something like 25 years after the first internal combustion engine car started. Before that, two gallon tins. And I think we might be a little bit further than that now, even though our friend Scott Morrison um, really thinks that they're going to end the long weekend because you can't charge them anywhere and you have to wait forever. Well, I decided I wasn't going to get annoyed. I went, challenge accepted. So September last, sorry, two years ago now, September 2019, I did what I called the EV Long Weekend Tour. And that was my tour, 2,400 Ks around Victoria, seven days. Didn't charge up during the days at each time. I could comfortably do two, three, 400 Ks in a day. And that was my trip. Car did it brilliantly. I was buggered at the end of it. But I think I proved the point that even without DC fast charging, the equivalent of basically two gallon tins, when that was available, when I did that, you could still easily do it. And now there are actually a number of DC fast chargers going in. So I could, uh, are all around Victoria and more going in even as I speak. So the days of the two gallon tin are virtually gone and we're starting to get our EV pumps around Australia. And that's what we have here. This is what is, this is actually a couple of months old now, I shouldn't really update it, um, of the DC fast chargers available this is actually found via plugshare.com. And you can just basically select out all the other options and just say, I want to see DC chargers. I want to see three phase outlets if you've got a U-Butte portable charger. Or I can say, okay, who's happy to let me use their um, PowerPoint if I just need a, an hour's top up to get to one of these DC chargers. And that's what's available. And there are more going in all the time. Notice, however, there is still a bit of a desert out in the east of Victoria. Uh, I believe some work is starting to be done there too. Uh, the future, well, you'll be able to charge at home. That, that's my leaf, my old leaf when I used to charge, when I used to have that one. Charging at home, that's 90% uh, of your charging. Workplace charging, well, you can put up big solar farms and you could be charging off free solar and totally renewable energy. You can have community DC charges. That one's at the Cape down at um, Cape Patterson. Actually, that one was, they've actually replaced that one. I was uh, having some issues with that one has been replaced since, but it's basically a local community. Uh, I think that was about a 40 or 50 kilowatt charger. You can have the proprietary networks, Tesla. They do actually have CCS plugs on them. And I suspect eventually they will have a subscription fee. It's simply you just need to be able to subscribe to Tesla like you subscribe to the other uh, 
networks, as I'll show here, uh, the NRMA throw in uh, charges all around New South Wales. They are a wonderfully handy set of charges. When there was the bushfire starting September 2019, I was up in Coffs Harbour and I had a quick look. I was about to come down the coast and could see smoke heading about 30k after I got about 30k's out of Coffs Harbour south. So I had a quick look on PlugShare, went, yep, there's charges at um, Tamworth and Dubbo. So I just went inland and from Coffs Harbour back to Melbourne was still only two days, same as a petrol car. And then you have, of course, the networks like petrol stations, that one's Charge Fox, and that you pay for your electricity through those. But if you're only, even if you're paying a little more than you would normally for electricity, you're only using the 10% or less of your, your driving. So it all washes out in the long run. Ah, yes, what's available? World, oh, 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 ID3 is in fact a really nice car. That's a VW that's selling like hotcakes over there. And there's bucket loads more. There are something like in Europe, you can choose, I think I counted up the other day, over 40 EV models, and that's not including the quadricycle category, of which there's a bucket load more. All around the world, there's something like about 120 models, and, and they're growing every day. There are new announcements. However, here in Australia, we have 16. Fortunately, um, I should say that's when I last first, let's well, see, 2017, we had nine. Was it nine? Yes, so it was 20, no, 2019, we had nine, and 2017, we had six. So things are improving, albeit slowly. So I won't, I'll leave you to look at this afterwards. I'll, I'll give you an address if you want to get a copy of the slides at the end of this presentation. But they're all on the road prices. And I generally just go through each time I do a presentation and, and check what the current prices are on the road. Uh, so there are a number coming to Australia. Some of them are a bit rubbery on their numbers. The Tesla Model Y, for instance, has been on the cusp of arriving for a while. Um, hopefully we'll say it's it in the second half of this year. A number of others are looking very good for turning up behind the Ionic 5, which I kept forgetting about, but it's actually due um, somewhere between July to September. Tesla Roadster is another one that keeps getting put off at the moment. There's a couple of BMWs, Porsche Taycan Cross is expected the second half of this year. There's a couple of vans and buses arriving soon. Um, and also as BYD have made a promise of, of uh, a van and a couple of cars. However, they have, BYD have made promises before an imminent arrival and then oh, exceedingly good prices and then never heard of again. So I'll wait and see till the order books open up and I have some here, but supposedly in the next month or so, they'll be arriving. Uh, oh yes. And as opposed to stealing the tradies ute, uh, these things are the coming EV utes and SUV so off-road recreational vehicles. This is a selection of half a dozen that'll be due in the next six to 18 months. Um, and as you can see, there's some pretty big utes that are coming out and available. And they have really good advantages over the current trader ute. Uh, they include, you can run AC power outlet. So your vehicle to load. Um, so if you've got a remote side or you can't be bothered, the power fails, you just plug into your car, they'll have outlets. There's extra space for loads because you don't have the motor in the way. So the Bollinger, which is that one on your bottom left, if you look at the front block square at the very front of the car, that from there right to the very tailgate, there's basically a square section that runs through between the seats, flat floor. You can get 5.2 meter length straight in. Uh, one of the advantages of the EV and the Rivian, as you can see there, there's a sort of optional kitchen, which I'll talk a little more about in a moment, but that is a great big space under there spare because there's no transmission tunnel or anything else um, that they can put all sorts of gadgets in. So they are also whisper quiet for your weekend trip in the bush. So you know, no diesel roar anymore, which would be very nice. And for the Rivian, they have an option of that full electric kitchen with a camping tent on top. So what more could you want for your EV long weekend, your EV weekend away? So if anyone wishes to buy one of those Rivians to give uh, Scott Morrison a drive, um, maybe he would understand that they do not um, either ruin the long weekend or steal a tradies ute away from them. Fuel cell EVs, yes, often a lot of information and, and announcements about them. Toyota Mirai, Honda Nexo, Honda Clarity, Renault have, have announced that there'll be a master fuel cell EV by the end of this year. Um, none of them will be available to buy beyond this year and maybe even next year, at least only for the next one. I think the few mirrors are turned up under the same deal. They're only lease and demonstration fleets of you know, 10, 20 cars. 
negligible refueling capacity. We have two refueling stations, one of which is public, there's another one or two getting built, but they are very expensive and time consuming to build. And to, they're basically a refining facility. Um, they take a huge amount of electrical energy to requirement to generate the H2. In fact, it's something like three to five times for an EV doing the same distance. So I suspect that they might very well do what uh, electric cars did at the start of last century, which is wander back to the background and keep developing for some time. So they, I think the time might come, as I say, with the film, Who Killed the Electric Car? In, um, uh, when was that? Oh, 10 years ago or more. Um, that was put out. I suspect for those people who are young enough to be around in 2080, uh, there'll be a film coming out called Who Killed a Hydrogen Car? Because when we have lots and lots of free renewable energy, it doesn't matter if you waste a bit creating hydrogen, in which case um, they have their advantages, but at the moment, um, they're really not a green option. Oops, um, I'm going to skip through these. You can grab the details later on, but there are a number of secondhand offerings and with the Konas and things starting to get to about two years old now, there's probably a few of those popping up. Although curiously, I was looking the other day on secondhand prices of Konas, I could sell mine still for the same price I bought it for. They are that popular and that few of them are coming into the country still um, because the manufacturers find it a lot easier to sell them in countries that support EVs as opposed to us. Um, so they're very numbers limited. So people want them and want one now, they'll tend to grab a secondhand one and the prices are quite high as a result. Anyway, there's a few numbers there. I'll leave you to browse that later. There are also a few other interesting options. There are what are called grey imports or private imports. Um, things like the good car company are doing bulk imports and they're actually making the effort to uh, provide a warranty and mechanic, local set up local mechanics to work on them. So you do have the same sort of backup within your local area, at least as a dealer network. But the dealers, generally speaking, do not like grey imports um, and generally won't work on them or provide um, backup or service. Oh, and Blade Electrons I mentioned down there, they were about 50 of them were converted uh, by a business down here that sadly went broke twice. And also sadly, they are all pretty much every one of them individual cars, effectively a prototype each time. And it's the reason why I gave up repairing electric vehicles because I got a name for being able to get the things back on the road and staying there, which eventually drove me nuts. And I went, I've got better things to do than, than basically spend $2 an hour spending time working out every single car and, and fixing them again. So uh, not for the faint harder and definitely for the DIY because as nobody will actually, it's just not worth paying someone to work on them. Um, now we come to the environment and you and why they really benefit. Um, first up, the env environment, and if you're driving around towns, no tailpipe pollution. So no idling pollution, schools, all that sort of inner city congestion of traffic jams, traffic lights. Reduced overall emissions, as I'll put in up the next slide. Uh, negligible emissions of using your uh, solar, own solar or green power subscription. And you definitely have reduced waste coolants, oils, brake pads, because regenerative braking basically means that most of the braking energy is put back into the battery rather than wasted in friction, heat, and wearing of pads and brakes. Um, Yes, there are ethical sourcing of some battery minerals, but a lot of the manufacturers are now working really hard to prevent that being a problem and, and working on contracts and, and basically checking through the supply chain. Um, but that also, also equally applies to many other products that we our modern Western lifestyle demands. So I don't know whether we can dump poor EVs as the, the whipping boy for everything else that we do. Uh, and for you, well, it's certainly much reduced costs. I pay $165 once a year or 15,000 Ks for my Kona, and that's fixed uh, price for the next 10 years with that one. And basically it gets a, uh, what you basically walk around and a safety check, and then they um, update the maps and off I go again. Uh, electricity is certainly much cheaper than petrol, although the Victorian government is not helping there. At the moment, we, we won't go there tonight unless somebody asks a few questions about it. Uh, on the right tariff, your fuel may effectively be free. Uh, okay, I've just recently updated this table and as ever, it just keeps improving. Um, in Victoria, so all those colored bars, all the blues and oranges and yellows, uh, how much uh, CO2 equivalent emissions a Kona will put out per 10,000 kilometers. So in Victoria, it'd be 1.54 tons per 10,000 kilometers versus the current Corolla, and the city cycle is 1.9. So you're still effectively 400 kilograms for my 10,000 Ks. So something like about 20% uh, better off. 
And in every other state, it's way better improved. And in Tasmania, it's one eighth for the city cycle, or what is that, one sixth for the combined cycle if you drove everywhere. The only situation in the whole of Australia where you're worse off running on grid power is if you use the Kona or electric car for all of your travel, so city and country within Victoria, so you don't plug into a better state like South Australia or Tassie, and then you're about 5%, not even that, so 2.3% 2 .3 worse off. And that assumes you're not charging using your own solar panels or green power. So the moment you do that, you're instantly producing less carbon dioxide equivalent than the equivalent petrol car. And this, by the way, is using the Department of Environment and Energy's national, actually they're not called that anymore, I should update that name, uh, national green NGA factors, and using the 2020 tables. Um, so I wrote an article for the 2017 data in Renew143, and a new one had just come out for the data summary for the 2020 data at the Driven. And for those of you who have a local member who says that um, there's no point, point driving an EV to save CO2 emissions, except in Tassie, maybe, not mentioning Craig Kelly by name, you're welcome to send them this table. Okay, costs, well, they just save you money. You, 10,000 Ks of the Renault Zoe, just picking the numbers off from the Green Vehicle Guide, which is not the best place to be getting it, but it's a good place for comparisons. Um, you're looking at around $1,500 for 10,000 kilometres saved a year. Again, I won't go too much into that detail because I would like to finish in about seven or eight minutes. Um, but yes, it does save money, both on energy costs, on uh, not spending the money on your premium fuel and service estimates as well. Now, the key point here is when to consider current to buy one. Uh, so if you travel less than 50 kilometres a day, any of the EVs on the market will do your job. So you could pick the cheapest one and I, off you go. Uh, if you're travelling less than 140 k's a day, they will still all still do it. Travelling less than 200, the only one that starts falling off the list is the Kangoo ZE because it doesn't have a DC fast charge and it certainly doesn't even have a, a faster charging system than seven kilowatts. 300 Ks, the Kangoo's gone, Hyundai Ionics, yeah, struggling a little, but it's still gonna do okay, um, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into any more depth than that, but it just gives you some ideas about prices. If you're at the moment, 60,000 is still your um, general number. For the MG ZS, they're under 50 now, 44,000 on the road. And there's a few more coming. Hopefully there's an article today coming out on the VW ID3. They're hoping to come in at the under 50K range too. So we might get a few more in that range. BYD have promised it. Um, we'll wait and see if they arrive. Uh, and if you're looking for uh, more details of these tables, I've actually written an article up on the driven that went up a couple of days ago. Again, the same selection criteria applied to used EVs. There's a number of them around. I said the 30 kilowatt hour leaf is a that type of grey import, private import. You can actually privately import some of the 40 kilowatt hour or even 63 kilowatt hour leaves now. Um, so they would give you options, although they're not a lot cheaper than, so the 64 kilowatt, 62 kilowatt leaf, if you import it, much the same price as buying one here. So maybe not worth buying one now, you can get them here. But if you want a 30 or 40 kilowatt one, you can get a cheaper one uh, quite comfortably here if it's grey import. Anyway, I'll leave you to browse those at a later date. Uh, practicalities. I've written that article in Renew on uh, your wiring upgrades that may be required. If an old switchboard like that, I can guarantee you'll need a new switchboard and probably a new service line coming in from the street because it'll be probably a 32 amp supply. And if you plug a EV at full charging rate than a home supply, it is 32 amps. So you don't turn any lights on if you're charging a car, unless you upgrade the supply. It's not the electric car's fault, it's your wiring has probably been hovering on the point of needing an upgrade for, for a little while. Uh, if somewhere has a charge off the street, uh, certainly issues with lead safety, strata title homes. I have some articles written there, uh, edition 145 covers a few of those issues. Uh, selecting an appropriate tariff, some businesses use what's called a maximum demand tariff, which means their price is based on whatever is the maximum amount of electricity they use at any one time. So if you happen to plug in your EV during a day when all your machinery is running, your electricity tariff is going to be horrible. Um, and there are actually some home tariffs, I think up in Queensland, starting to offer that one. So be careful. If you switch to the right tariff, they go, can be pretty cheap. Some of the off-peak tariffs are looking pretty good now if you're only charging overnight, which is all I ever do with mine. Um, choice of your EVSE capacities. It's basically um, what sort of money you want to spend on your charger, uh, load management, 
PV sensing, so you only go up and down, you only use your own PV output um, and may have a particular budget. There's actually a couple of articles coming out in this coming renew, which is out in the next few weeks, um, uh, EVSE buyer's guide. Uh, and you may need to buy extra leads and adapters. You will definitely need to buy one for public EV use. Um, and as I saw, so I call that last one that came up a jerry can in a bag because it basically plugs into a PowerPoint of some sort. That one plugs into a 32 amp three phase outlet, but you can actually make adapters or get adapters to go down to a PowerPoint and just set it to accordingly. Uh, when can I afford one? That's always the biggie. Uh, first vehicle segment bed prices predict um, about 2024. And that was coming from the Senate inquiry, Tim Storer's Senate inquiry. That was a table that I picked up out of there. Um, basically the SUV market is expected to start crossing that threshold and then continue to decline in price. So after that, they'll become cheaper than their petrol. Because in theory, an electric car takes about a third less people to build um, than a petrol car, which is rather sad for the employees, but probably the same for Coopers and Wheelwrights and others. It's the world moves on in technology and hopefully there will be new better jobs for them to pick up afterwards anyway. Uh, and various prediction houses have actually come up with it. Again, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have come up with as battery prices fall below um, certain threshold, which is generally $100 per kilowatt hour US, which are pretty much hitting it now. So it's basically much the economies of scale that are holding the prices up. Um, that's the threshold for uh, the price parity point. Okay, when will there be only EVs device? So you may have no choice. Uh, well, these countries have all already set sales dates to end the sales of internal combustion engine cars. And that includes hybrids, not plug-ins, include plug-in hybrids are okay for after this date, but not hybrids. And UK has actually said, no, we'll go back from 2040, we'll say 2035. And then they went, hmm, how about, no, we'll go back 2035 and pick 2032. And now they're talking about uh, announcing at the COP26, I think it is, it'll be um, later this year in the UK. They're talking about actually announcing a 2030 date for the end of internal combustion engine. They're starting to see countries with significant um, uh, auto industries based on internal combustion engines like China and France and UK, England, um, actually saying no more. And a number of companies, auto companies already said, A, we're not putting any more money into internal combustion engine development. What you've got now is what you're always going to have. And some of those are saying we're having a phase out date. Uh, Ford, GM, Volvo have all said they have a date where they'll just stop building internal combustion engines. So unless we start looking at um, importing old clapped out diesels uh, and um, other polluting cars after about 20, 30, 35, become the, um, what was it? Uh, Fidel Castro's Cuba um, of the South Pacific, um, we may have some difficulty choosing anything but an EV. And even in Victoria here, there was a, a panel set up in Victoria of run of the mill day to day Victorians and asked them a whole lot of questions and got some consensus answers about what they thought about EVs. One of the biggies, they said, all people, or we should have a ban on petrol and diesel cars for sale being sold in Victoria. That would be hard to do in Victoria, it would have to be a national thing, but that certainly was a very strong sentiment of the group. Okay, if you want to find out more, um, Renew is, for those of you who already know, the Renew magazine. There were a couple of magazines and a, sorry, a couple of articles um, in the last one on EV etiquette, which is sort of how to share the roads and charging with other EV users and that discussion about the EV range, NEDC, US EPA, WLTP, and an in-depth discussion of that. In the next edition, there's an EVSE buyer's guide by Lance, and there's also a conversion electrical work safety article by myself as well as a couple of other bits and pieces. There's also the Australian Electric Vehicle Association. You can go to their site for membership, or there's in fact the discussion forum, which is free to join. And there's lots of really useful discussions and information, or you can post your own questions there. And that's under forums AVA. You can also, and a bit of a plug for me, uh, I have now set up a business called EV Choice because there's just so much demand for information and support in the EV transition. So actually do a number of things now, and it's just a way of trying to um, make my spare time and a poorer income for the amount of time I spend on these things, pay myself a little bit back. Uh, but I also host the EV, same EV information sheets as I write and maintain on the AEVA website. As you can see there, it's just, you can click on a sheet and get a two page com comparison sheet of all the BEVs. 
available, or you can actually look up just a summary sheet of all the BEVs and on the back FEVs plug-in hybrids um, and just click on that one as well. And I keep that one up to date. In fact, I just uploaded the latest version of that um, general summary sheet this afternoon. So the very latest detail is there on, on my site. I haven't quite put it up on the AVA site yet. Uh, other EV news and information websites in Australia, uh, there's a Driven, who I write for. Uh, there's EV Talk, which is another Australian focused EV web, uh, inform or article website. The Electrical Vehicle Council, which is the um, represents the electrical vehicle industry, but they have a number of interesting data and information bits about electric vehicles there. Um, so you, again, if you're looking for those links, send me an email and I'm happy to, to forward you this, a copy of this presentation. Um, summing up, well, EV transition is definitely more than just cars. It's about all forms of transport going to electric and just getting rid of the emissions. Uh, so BEVs in Australia will reduce carbon emissions already and it, even if you're using grid power. And if you're getting to a green grid, it's basically reduced to zero and internal combustion engine never will. As I said, fuel cell EVs will reach their emissions a very long time after BEV. And I'm guessing that if you want a clean grid with no emissions, then it's very hard to get it quickly, let alone trying to extend the amount of power we put out that's green. So 2080 might be the time for fuel EVs, fuel cell EVs. Um, you're definitely removing exhaust emissions from built up areas. Uh, they will do the distance as I've already proved. And uh, you know, I've done a number of trips from Melbourne to Sydney, Melbourne to Canberra, Melbourne to Coffs Harbour, and hoping to do once lockdown ends, uh, Melbourne to Brisbane and back fairly soon. Uh, they're definitely cheaper to run and they're for service and fuel costs and for fleets, lots less downtime for servicing. Uh, they're better to drive, yeah, instant acceleration. They just, just Once you've driven one, you will not want to go back. Um, they're getting cheap all the time. As I said, the price parity point begins around 2024 and they should all have reached that by 2028 and the ones that hit it at 2024 will be cheaper and the death spiral of internal combustion engines will begin because nobody will want to buy one in 2028, 2029 when you're not even allowed to buy a new one after the 2030, 2035 dates. Um, and they're becoming available in even more segments, including use. Um, and they will soon, well, not particularly soon, but it will feel like it the way time is going at the moment, uh, become the only option. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye on it, even if there's not one ready for you yet. And I think I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, any burning questions? I think that's where the Q&A will start. And I'll, so evnews at bigpond.com is if you wish to email me, and I will now stop sharing and let uh, the other people start setting the Q&A off. Thank you, Bryce. That was excellent. Um, very comprehensive. So for everybody, would you like to put your questions in the Q&A section? Uh, um, yes, I, uh, I can always see the first one about Google and not secure. It's um, a, a Google thing at the moment. Because it's a um, nascent website, I didn't want to pay the extra couple of hundred dollars to buy the um, certificate that um, uh, basically get it. Uh, so if you do www.evchoice.com.au, you, you will get through. Um, Google isn't quite happy if you do it that way. So and yes, do you get the slides? Yes, it just email me that to the email to that email address, and I'll I'll send you through a copy. So Bryce, the first question is from Kate. Are there any four-wheel drive electric vehicles that don't cost as much as the Tesla? Uh, short answer: not yet. Uh, longer answer, the, I'm just trying to think which one, there's a couple coming um, that will have four wheel drive options that will be cheaper, but they'll be certainly cheaper than the Model X, but not, the Model Y will have a four wheel drive option. Um, and there's a number of others that I can't quite think of off the top of my head, but they will, but uh, they'll, they'll be under a hundred thousand fairly soon. And then they'll be working their way down. The ID4, I think will have, the VW ID4 will have a four wheel drive option, I think. Don't quote me on that one, but I'm pretty certain it does. Good. And Kate also asks, what do you think of the good car company's supply model? I think it's quite a good one. I don't don't have anything against it. I, I'm not a great fan of great imports because they will be, especially, they're fine if you buy them and keep them in the area that they were set up to be serviced by. But if someone buys it and takes it into state, which is not uncommon with EVs, um, they may have difficulty in trying to find someone that can service it there because the dealers won't touch it. So good on them for what they're doing and it's certainly keeping the manufacturers honest and if it's kept in a local area and the local mechanics um, stay in business then 
yes, and also a way of encouraging mechanics to start taking up EV work. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't see an enormous bit about it, but you need to be just a little bit wary of the that servicing and, and maintenance and parts issue because some of the parts are different on Japanese cars as the, the same car brought here. I think they're pretty big in Tasmania and Hepburn Springs and this one in mm. Sydney. Yes, yeah, they're bringing sort of 20, 30 cars at a time to those group buyers. And as they get older, those cars, there will be a few that will become available for spare parts. And hopefully the good car company will be bringing, I think they'll talk about bringing a few spare ones, spares ones in as well. But um, let's see what happens. I think they're going to bring them in to, for batteries. Right, good. And Janice asks, I have a 2019 Nissan Leaf and I'm aware that it isn't rated to tow. <laughs> still attach a tow bar and accept the lower range as I only need to travel low distances, less than 20 kilometres. I only want to tow a trailer with up to 500 kilograms. Um, yes, it, it's it, far be it for me to recommend putting a tow bar on a car that, that says no tow range rating, but I have got a tow bar on my Kona because the petrol tow bar fits perfectly to the Kona. And if you look at the driven early next week, I'm actually writing an article on towing at the moment and have a list of all EVs I can and can't tow and a bit of a backhanded comment of why, why uh, manufacturers are not yet rating them for towing or we can't get tow bars for many of them yet. Uh, so I'll leave that one to be answered by the article. It's a fairly long answer, but should be early to mid next week. It should be up on the driven. And a lot of that reason is regulatory, isn't it? It's quite involved to get. Yes and no. It's just there's a the small number of them are being brought in, so they can't be bothered doing the regulatory paperwork and cr- jump the hurdles to actually add a tow rating when they register when they register the cars on the um, uh, the government re- website. So the Tesla, for instance, Model Three came in with a 910 kilogram rating for towing, except that Tesla haven't bothered bringing in the tow bars to fit to them, and. It's only recently that a few manufacturers imported have started bringing in overseas tow bars. So up until the last few months, you couldn't put a tow bar on a Tesla Model 3, even though it had the tow rating, because it just couldn't get them. That's now been solved, and there's three or four companies in Australia now selling tow bars for them, but they're not cheap. Right. And Andy says, many of the new cars coming out are huge. This seems ridiculous for EVs if you're trying to be efficient. Are there any small EVs coming to Australia? Yeah, there's lots. As I mentioned early in the piece when I said there's 40 EVs available in all sorts of market segments in Europe and a much more similar size number of electric, small electric vehicles or urban electric vehicles or quadricycle category um, available, which are small ones like the Renault Twizy. I think there's actually, um, did I put that article up yet? There's actually one that I've put on about part of this um, categories and sizes and availability. But it's, um, yes, for some reason, manufacturers seem to think Australian like big cars. So they keep sending us big big cars when there's actually lots of smaller ones around. The VW ID3 is not a big car. And they're now talking about bringing that one over in the next year or so. The Renault Zoe wasn't a big car, uh, four metres. My Kona is, in fact, although it looks big, isn't. It's 4.1 metres. Uh, so it's only a little bit longer than the Zoe. It's actually remarkably small. For, um, for its looks. So there are a number around four metres, really small ones. Some of them fall in the quadricycle category, which is why they're not here. Um, and some of them are that the manufacturers think Australians don't like small cars. But personally, I would like one. And the MG, is that a fairly small one? Uh, it's a little bit bigger than my Kona. Okay. And Hugh asked, what is the conservative kilometres for a Tesla free? Conservative, uh, if I am quick, I can actually pull up that table and pull it off the top of my head. I can't uh, think of it uh, very, very quickly. So I'll just have a look at, um, here we go, uh, the Tesla Model 3 going down the table um, for the standard range, standard range plus, they say, 430 uh, WLTP and 580 for the um, Tesla Model 3 long range, and probably a little bit less than that in reality, maybe 390, 400 if you're heading down the highway or a bit less, it's about around 400-ish for a test of Model 3. The, for a standard range plus Model 3 or a Kona, the Kona actually has a bit of range, as will the Kia in Iroh because it's exactly the same running gear as the Kona. 
And John asks, so if you have solar panels, does it make sense to buy an EV plus a home battery or the latest Nissan Leaf instead and use it as the battery? Uh, that's a really good question. I may have read my article on saying that there's probably more hype than substance in vehicle to grid uh, because I charge my Kona once every week or two at the moment with lockdowns and things, maybe three or four weeks at a time. And it's quite nice not plugging in the car from one week to the next. So the idea of if I do beetle out for a couple of days and come back, unplugging and replugging to keep my car connected to the grid um, strikes me as being particularly annoying uh, versus having a small battery system in the house that's there 24 seven. So if I'm away and the power fails, like uh, Callista, et cetera, at the moment, um, you will have your battery and you can just switch off everything except the fridge and it could run off your battery system for a few days to a week anyway. Uh, whereas you can drive away with your car and stay somewhere else whilst the power's failed. So I'm not a great fan. It will certainly have its advantages in remoter areas, um, off-grid systems that will be brilliant for people can charge up at a DC fast charge and use that power on um, uh, cloudy days, winter days. That will be really handy advantage. I'm not sure it will take off to the extent that a lot of people think it will, um, purely because of the inconvenience of plugging and replugging versus having a 24-7 battery designed for your off um, standalone or not standalone for your battery backup system. I think I've gone round and round in circles on that one, but it's it's a interesting answer and it really does suit what your purposes will be. Yeah. Good. And Marissa from Sydney asks, thank you, Bryce. Excellent information. Oh, Can you. you comment on the electric buses and trucks and their take up in Australia? Uh, yes, buses and tra- I'll, I'll start. I'll separate them out. Uh, buses, uh, they're now moving into the mainstream for the mainstream manufacturers of buses, which is always sounding good. And they're building in a handful of numbers in a four, six, eight trial full electric buses for various councils around Australia. There's a number of trials being run at the moment. I'm not quite sure why they keep needing trials, except maybe to work out how they're going to do charging in their particular depots and things, and, and just familiarised drivers with it because they've been around long, around long enough overseas to get the experience. Overseas, I think the big school bus manufacturer, Bluebird, or whatever they call themselves, um, they've got either delivered or standing orders for over 400 school buses. They're the major manufacturer of the American school buses. Um, and they've got, they'll probably have delivered over 400 electric buses by the end of this year and st- are still taking orders at a rapid rate. So I said that province in China it's just changed over its bus fleet to 10,000. It just made the decision, got rid of the diesels, put in the electric for clean green energy or clean green anti-pollution sort of uses for buses around town, which would be a much better idea. So Australia's, as usual, a laggard when it comes to EV adoption and the same for buses. But previously, there were a number of companies, smaller companies experimenting with EV buses. And sadly, they either went and and decided it was a lot easier to buy, build something else, or went broke in the process. So it's nice to see the big manufacturers with Volgrens and those sort of ones actually starting to build EV buses, which looks promising that they think it's now a serious area to get into. And is that in several states in Australia? or? Yeah, there's a couple in Victoria, and I think there's one in Queensland and one in South Australia. Right. I know there's definitely a couple of Volgren and... Uh, General League or something like I can't remember the other one in one in Ballarat and one other one in Victoria as well. And trucks, Marissa. Ah, yes, and trucks. Yes, we've got SEA trucks doing the conversions at that very early slide that I had. They're doing garbage trucks, um, cherry picker type things, all sorts of stuff. They'll take a, a Glide Ivico, not Ivico, I can't remember the, the brand of car, truck, but they will basically put in a really nice electric drivetrain. They've got a very good system that they put in and they're building up their business at the moment. They've got some number of overseas contracts, especially in America. So it's looking promising for another Australian company to do well there, just like Tritium, which is do the DC fast chargers that sell them all over the world. So that's the truck. And there's lots of um, Sandvik are actually, um, they, they are big into mining machinery. Uh, they look, they've got an EV machinery arm now. They're actually going to talk at the EV e-conference last year that we ran except that it turned out to be Thanksgiving on the day of our conference. So they went from, yeah, yeah, we'd really love to talk to, uh, no, nobody works under Thanksgiving. So we couldn't get anybody from America that day. Uh, but yeah, they would have given a talk on uh, where they're at. Uh, Volvo 
they're doing the same thing. They're developing quite a few interesting options in electric machinery. So they're available here in Australia? No, not yet. Uh, like everything else, EV, we are way behind. Yeah, you'd have thought the mining industry might be quite interested there. Yes, well, there's a couple of companies here. One's importing a Brazilian uh, four-wheel drive ute, so a, a heavy-duty ute for electric driving underneath for underground mining. Uh, I can't think of the name. They did a talk at the EV conference last year. And there's also another one that's converting Land Cruiser um, utes, so the, the 70 series, to electric uh, for mining use as well. So we have two companies actually doing conversions or a direct import of body, or the Brazilian one is bringing in the body and doing the electric conversion here. He did a really interesting talk at that conference, which, by the way, you can still access. If you have a look on the AEVA website, you can actually still pay $25 and get access to all the talks. Good. And Arthur asked, and this might be a bit of a loaded question, has your Kona battery been replaced yet? No, but I also, um, I've done nearly 30,000 Ks and it hasn't caught fire yet either. So I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with a small number of 15, 15 fires around the world in that time. So I think it's a fairly good piece of, um, what's the word, buying reputation to say, even though it's not a big issue in terms of numbers, we're still going to replace the battery, but they've gone a bit quiet, I think, on, on the, I think it's sort of gone, oh, it's going to cost a bit and, and trying to work out how to do the, the um, roll out the program. So I haven't heard any more apart from email saying they're going to do it. All right. Uh, Russell says, great presentation, thank you. Uh, what speeds do you drive at for your regional driving? Uh, 100, 110. When I was, uh, I don't spare the horses. Um, when I was heading to Canberra, I was doing 110, 115. I hope there are no police listening. Um, uh, I just set the cruise control to that and it just cruised very nicely. At that stage, there were no DC fast charges between Albury and Canberra. So I was running the heater because it was winter 2019. Um, so I had the heater going flat out. I was scooting along down the highway at 110, 115. And I got into Canberra and I dropped in the mate where I was staying that night with 38 kilometres left on the range, which having owned a leaf before that, um, 38 kilometres was a lot of rain. So I was quite comfortable with that, although some people may not be. And talking about a leaf, John asks, uh, does it have V2X capability? The Kona? No. No, the nothing leaf. with the CCS. Leaf. Oh, the leaf. All leafs do, yes but you can't actually buy the equipment to do it here in Australia or not legally connected anyway. They're only doing trials. So the car can do it, but the, the house can't do it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, and Linda asks, which EV do you recommend for long distance driving at an affordable purchasing price? And would a second-hand EV be up to the job? Thanks for your excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I bought the Kona to do interstate work, and pretty much everyone I know that's got a Kona says it's probably the best budget EV, in inverted commas, uh, EV. for It's the best bang for buck if you want an EV for going interstate. Uh, if you're wanting something to do regional work, um, a second-hand Renault you know, Zoe is fine, but you can't do DC fast charge. So as long as you're fully charged, you could get to, to Ballarat and just, just do a bit of a top up on a PowerPoint or a um, 32 amp, seven kilowatt. Actually, they will do 22 kilowatt AC. So even if you find a three phase charger, and there are a few in Ballarat, or a three phase outlet, if you have a, a good uh, portable charger, and that will comfortably give you, um, what was it, about 150 kilometers charged an hour, 100, a bit over 100 kilometers charged an hour on a three phase outlet. So they're, they're even a Renault Zoe would do it at the moment, and you pick them up. There's not many. Once people buy a Zoe, they tend to hang on to them. We bought one for my partner, actually, in the middle of the last deep lockdown and got a very good deal on the run out. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, you don't see many of them for sale. But if you could grab one, they're probably low 30s, mid 30s at the moment for price. The MG ZS is not bad, although tests are generally showing up. It doesn't do very well to even get its WLTP range. My Kona will do the WLTP range all better. Um, and, again, if you look up, uh, it was Chasing Cars is a new Australian website. They did a, uh, a test of five EVs available in Australia and see how close they came to the WLTP. The Kona was bang on. Uh, the Tesla wasn't too far off, and it wasn't great. Um, and the MG ZS came in 
like only about 70% of its WLTP range. So it's, it's certainly a cheaper and a very nice car, but the MG probably, even for the size battery, is the least efficient in a way. The Leaf is not bad. A 62 kilowatt hour Leaf would be quite good, but for the price, the Kona is the more efficient. It will get you further. E Nairo would be look worth looking at as well because it is basically a Kona in drag. It's just a slightly bigger body. And talking about charging, you're using one particular uh, website to find where the charges are or there are multiple ones? And... Multiple ones. Uh, plug share is sort of a, a general community one. So people either add their own charges to it or if they found one, we'll, we'll add it. So members of plug share, which you just sign up to, uh, will just add them as they find them. You can also use the apps run by ChargeFox or EV Network, and they will show you their charges and whether they're available or not for charging. So PlugShare pretty much shows you where they are, and if people actually um, log in, and they'll you'll actually see that they're being used, although most people using them generally don't, uh, whereas the EV or ChargeFox apps automatically show you when they're being used because they have to log in through the app to be charged to use the electricity. So there are three main ones. I've noticed a lot of them are Tesla only. Is that... Mm. Uh, Tesla, well, you can't really blame Tesla. They asked, they said they'll make it an open network if the other manufacturers would put in some money to build the network because they were putting a lot of money into building it. And the other manufacturers said, no, nah, we're not going to help you in any way, form, um, build up your company. So we won't put any money into your network. So Tesla just went, well, in that case, if you're not putting any money in, you don't, you shouldn't be using it. So it's a Tesla only network, but it does use the same plug now as everybody else. And rumours are starting to fly around about Tesla setting up a subscription or charging card system like EV and ChargeFox. So those of us with Konas or anything else with a CCS and plug and a decent sized battery needing it uh, might be able to use the Tesla network one day. There's no reason to stop it except that Tesla at the moment have it closed. It does use the right plug for it as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And Greg asks, who needs to legislate the fleet CO2 uh, grams per kilogram level like Europe to open the gate for Gulf EVs? Uh, the key would be basically cleaning a certain minister's desk and removing the layers of dust on the document because it's actually ready to go. It's been there for over three years now. So this is why we still use... Um, uh, ADR 8102, which is the old NEZC range standards, which comes up with these wildly optimistic numbers. Uh, and we have poor fuel economy standards for poor fuel quality standards. It's all contained in that document and it just isn't happening. And there's no reason for it to be pushed ahead from a government point of view at the moment. I'll leave that with the people to make their own speculations. I just wrote a fairly grumpy opinion piece and put that into the driven today. So uh, they may or may not publish it, but I was really particularly grumpy about this particular issue today. So Jennifer asks, I missed the beginning, so you may have addressed this already. Um, to charge my leaf regularly using my 10, 10 amp PowerPoint connection overnight off peak. Is mm -hmm. it okay to do that? Regularly, no. Your, your 10 amp PowerPoint or the plug will eventually start to melt. Um, it's better to put in a dedicated or dedicated 15 amp outlet and an industrial type one which has a screwed outlet on it because the leaf i don't know where the new ones do but the old ones came with a, a screw connection so it would actually you could put a screwed ring and tighten your three pin plug into the socket so it not only was firmly lodged in there it couldn't move it couldn't loosen so that's a better option than just a basic three pin outlet but i always recommend a proper EVSA, even if it's only set to 16 amps. It's just a better plug and it just lasts longer and it's just just more pleasurable experience for charging. And Russell asks, one of the, one, the house battery versus EV and V to G, what are the relative sizes of the batteries for home battery versus batteries in the car? Uh, well, a home battery is probably a tenth the size of the battery in the car, but um, do you need, a, like my Kona, 64 kilowatt hours of battery? Um, my house runs on two-ish kilowatt hours a day. 
that would give me 120 days to run off my Kona. I, mean, I must admit, I do use very little power. So if the average house is sort of four to 16 kilowatt hours a day, even a small size uh, battery, home battery system would run your house for a day or two or three if you just coach it off a few loads. So a six or 10 kilowatt hour battery, home battery system is all more than enough really for the few times, if you're only using a few, a few hours here or there, will not count the week-long dropouts for Callista, et cetera, at the moment in Victoria. But generally speaking, uh, a six to 10 kilowatt hour battery is more than enough to run um, a good energy efficient household for two or three days. Or, yeah, probably a couple of days. Let alone a couple of hours that you'd normally only need it for. Right. Yeah, I use a bit more electricity in that, unfortunately. Uh, Celia asks, many hybrid Outlander advertised at the moment, but could not see them on your second-hand assessment. What uh, two answers to that. One is I tend to stick to battery electric vehicles because it's just too big a field if I include plug-in hybrids. And secondly, plug-in hybrids are a very particular use case. So if you're doing the range or less of that hybrid for each of your drives, and so you're using it mostly for as an EV, that's fine, and that's the best case scenario that you might want it then to do an occasional 100, 200 kilometer run to Geelong or Ballarat or somewhere, in which case the plug-in hybrid is sort of two cars in one, which is nice. But if you're regularly doing 50 to 100 k's and the range is only 20 k's, then you may as well buy a smaller, lighter, fuel-efficient petrol car. You'll use less petrol than the plug-in hybrid. So it's a very particular use case that plug-in hybrids are good for, and outside of it, um, they actually use more fuel than a, a small, light, efficient petrol car. Don't the Outlanders have close to 50 kilometre range now? Yep, that's what I'm saying. If, size your car to the range. So if you're doing 50 kilometre range, so if you're doing, say, 40 kilometres or less in a day, it would do it quite nicely and do a few k's over that for a weekend run or something. Then you've got your two cars in one, and it's a cheaper option. But if you're regularly doing a 70, 80 kilometre or even a 50 kilometre range because it um, return trip, you'd probably be stretching the battery use at the end, so you want to charge in the middle, um, then the plug-in hybrid is starting to look less good on a, a carbon emission and fuel saving uh, metric. Mm -hmm. So there are two reasons I leave the plug-in hybrids off. One is it's just too hard to keep track of everything. And two, they have a particular use case. So you really need to sit down and think about your usage and what might change into the future in the time you own it. Or the second car maybe. Mm option yeah so anonymous asks converting an old porsche to an electric engine is mm. too an expensive task to consider it is an expensive task but it's a fun one and i always say that the conversion industry will never go down or should never go down the track of converting day-to-day -day cars because the cost in parts and labor you're looking at 60 to 70 grand to do a halfway reasonable conversion and even that's not as good as say a, um, a 40 kilowatt hour leaf at less money so you wouldn't do it for day-to-day -day car you would buy a oem original equipment manufacturer car on the other hand uh, a good way of extending the life of day-to-day um, -day classics like some of the porsches um, beetles um, various other cars like a off the kind of thing off the top of my head, um, they would be uh, a really good candidate for conversions, in which case doing it yourself is fun. A year of weekends work on it um, and lots of research and lots of uh, chatting and, and making friends whilst doing that process. And it's, it's a good, fun hobby. And you get a really nice, fun driving car at the end of it, but it's not not financially. You would never do it. The people that wouldn't do hot rods if it was a, making money out of it, unless you're building one. Unless you're a company building them, in which case you make money, but uh, owning one, no. And do AEVA do that in their discussion groups? Yes, yes. So that forum, uh, there's a lot of conversion discussions in there. Right. Greg Knight asks, and I don't understand this question, who's desk? No so idea. Got me on that one. Help us on that one, John. We'll put that one on the desk for looking up. Uh, Hugh asks, what is the conservative kilometres for a Tesla free 2021 model? Uh, model 3, standard range or long range? Both. Both. Uh, standard range is WLTP range is 430. Long range is 580. You'd probably get a little less than that, but pretty close. 
if you look at that uh, chasing cars uh, test, I think they came in a bit under their WLTP range. The WLTP range is 430 and 580. If you look at the NEDC ranges on the Green Vehicle Guide, they're yeah, 500 and nearly 700. They're just, just insane. Right. John asks, how far ahead do you need to order a Kona or other EV? Is it four months or more? Uh, Kona's, I haven't actually checked lately, but there's plenty of sort of available on the web at the moment, so there seems to be a reasonable number. Depends on whether you want a particular colour and style or whether you'll take what's available. If you want to take something available, pretty much now, if you want to order something that is in your colour or a particular trim, then that is your three, four-month wait because it's got to be slotted into production schedule and they only run very small batches for Australia, so they, they sort of squeeze them in at midnight to 1am sort of <laughs> runs, I think. Right. Uh, Sila asks, thanks. Read the Outlander. I'm an out-of-towner and need to carry small farm loads. Would this be suitable? Uh, yes, if you're using it for a lot of little local work as well, if they use, take advantage of the electric part, uh, yes, go for it. If you're using it only for long runs, then you're never really going to get much advantage out of the electric. Uh, so I would probably buy something uh, a more fuel-efficient, Petrol, yeah, petrol car. In which case, um, so something that's smaller and lighter, and that would be more fuel efficient than the, the Outlander would be. Right, and Greg, who asked about the deaths, sorry, Bryce, did not actually specify who WHO is responsible for the vehicle emission standards, even though it's buried on his desk. Oh, desk. Yes, it's the Minister for um, Environment and Resources, I think. Right. Okay, good. Um, He's probably using it to prop up the desk because it rocked, which is probably why he can't find it. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we're coming close to the end there of our questions. Um, is there anything more you want to add on the uh, vans and uh, commercial area? And yes, yes, there's some interesting ones coming up. There's a, a van that was launched at the Brisbane Truck Show, the, uh, they call it the um, EV Auto EC11. It's an almost two-ton van. Um, I'm, that's what I'll be driving up to Brisbane to have a look at, actually. And I'm hoping to get a good look and a drive of it. Um, so they're available to order. I think the delivery is late this year. Uh, the, the SEA are doing a conversion type one, and that should be available fairly soon. BYD are promising one fairly soon. Again, BYD have made promises before about EV, so I'm waiting to see whether it turns up or not. But if it does, it'll be very interesting. The ACE, the one, the one that's being built here, uh, is still in an experimental stage, so it might be a little while off, but it's a, a small sort of four or 500 kilo light van. The new Kangoo ZE, the Renault Kangoo ZE, is a really good looking uh, electric van. It's currently, the one that they bring here is uh, only a 30-odd kilowatt-hour battery, and it's only got a 120-160K range and only 7 kilowatt AC charging, so you've got to wait six hours for a recharge if you happen to go too far in it. On the other hand, the new one's got a 44-kilowatt-hour battery, DC fast charge, 20, up to 22-kilowatt AC charge. Um, it's a really good, really practical EV van, so fingers crossed it actually will be brought here. Um, it'll be replacing the current model end of this year. Um, there's another one, the eCrafter by Peugeot that was announced in February. It's been, the order book's opened a couple of days ago. This is in the UK, so it's a right-hand drive model. Um, it's a people mover slash van. It's a really nice um, 50 kilowatt hour battery, 270 odd kilometer range, I think, WLTP. Um, again, we probably won't see that one due to all those um, uh, difficulties in, in just getting business case up for EVs in a country that doesn't support them. Uh, but there's plenty overseas of small, medium, you know, electric master, Peugeot, Renault, Citroen, all have electric vans over there of different sizes. We just don't see them here. Ford are producing them. Uh, Rivian are producing one in like about 10,000 of them for Amazon soon. So um, why Not aren't the Ford, ever, commercial mm. enterprises would be very keen yes. to use them? Mm. 
They should be because they did heaps less on running costs, lots less downtime. Um, there's, there's everything going for an electric van. They, they stack up really well. Yeah, I find it very odd. Mm. Um, I think Andy was asking about uh, many of the new cars are huge. It seems ridiculous for EVs if you're trying to be efficient, which we went through before. Mm. Are there any small EVs coming to Australia soon? Uh, um, I'll have a quick look, but I don't think so. Um, no. A short answer. The ID3, maybe. The VW ID3. And how... What sort of price is that one? They're talking under 50000 maybe closer to forty. Hmm, okay. Well, that's... Or starting price, anyway. Right. And is the Chinese bringing the BYD? We're going to bring in a cheap, small one, too, aren't they? Uh, as I said, I'll wait and see if it turns up. If it does, good. They'll be worth checking out. Um, they have made announcements before and are not followed through, so I'll, I'll wait and see there. Right, Okay. Right. Well, I don't know if there's any more questions to come. That's good. My voice, vo 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 voice has always run out. My brain has definitely run out. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I do a formal thank you, um, just remind people we're keen to keep offering these webinars um, and hope to be able to continue as Renew continues its transition but we do need some support and ideas. So after in a few minutes, we'll have a discussion group and see what people can do and ideas they've got. Uh, we'll have a brief poll in a second. Um, so please complete that and then hang on and come in to talk about the future. I was actually someone that called in from New Zealand. Hi to John Godfrey. Well, thank you. Um, now, that was a great evening. Uh, as I expected. Um, oh, thank you. Classes give so much information and so well presented. So thank you very, very much again. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks for all the really great questions. Oh, there's one on the lack of a battery fan in Leafs um, uh, that hasn't been answered. It's a short answer, the, a couple of answers there. The Leafs with the new batteries are still passively cooled like the early ones that had issues. Um, whether that's going to be an issue with the current batteries in the long run, we don't know. They seem to have improved things a bit. But with the Nissan Naraya, which is the replacement, Nissan will be putting in a cooling system, an active cooling system. So the Leaf will be the last passively cooled battery. After that, they, they will be like everybody else and have an actively cooled one. And so he's asked, was it an e-combi you had in the original the pictures at the start? Which I think mm. it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep, it's the e combi at uh, what they call the VW ID buzz. Right, great. Well, you'll have to uh, imagine the hundreds of participants clapping you now, Bryce. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give them a clap. Yeah. Thank you for, for asking so many good questions. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Thank you for everything. And um, we'll put the poll up now and then um, we'll continue on talking about the future.